welcome. My name is Susan Creston, and I will be giving a brief introduction and overview of the multidisciplinary approach to criminal justice. When I speak about the multidisciplinary approach throughout this presentation, I will also be talking about the multidisciplinary team. I sometimes refer to that as the MDT. If I use the phrase MDT, that is what I am referring to, the multidisciplinary team. Before we begin the presentation, though, I want to make sure that it is understood that while this protocol, this multidisciplinary team approach, was developed within the context of a common law or adversarial situation, it is adaptable to other criminal justice systems. For example, the inquisitorial system that is used throughout much of continental Europe. Fundamentally, anywhere that the cornerstones of cooperation and coordination within the criminal justice system are present, the multidisciplinary team can work. How does the multidisciplinary team improve service delivery to both survivors and the criminal justice system? Well, with the survivors, it reduces trauma and it provides, in the best circumstances, the seamless delivery of professional services, whether those services are medical, and that would be from the initial rape kit to ongoing, continuing needs that the survivor may have, or the legal services, ensuring that the survivor understands what is happening within the legal context, and obviously that would be within an age-appropriate manner, or within the social services, psychosocial services, mental health services, things like that, ensuring the seamless and coordinated delivery of these professional services. The second way that it assists is by improving the conviction rate within the criminal justice system. And it does this in a number of ways. First of all, it maximizes resources and eliminates duplicative efforts. For example, the interviews that the child will have to give. Prior to multidisciplinary teams, the child might be interviewed initially by a police officer, then by a doctor, then by a social service representative, then eventually by a prosecutor. With the multidisciplinary team approach, we eliminate that duplicative effort. We have one forensic interview of the child. That interview is shared with all the team members, and as such, the stress to the victim is lessened. But also, we have freed up time. Instead of taking four statements, we have one statement, and we share it within the team. We also improve the conviction rate by receiving training as a team. Prosecutors, police officers, social service professionals go as a team to receive training. This assists in making sure that the same information is shared within the team, that the team as a whole is working off the same information, and making sure that there aren't contradictory or conflict within the professions. For example, the police wanting to do one thing, whereas maybe the prosecutors want to do another. When you receive training as a team, you understand why things have to be done in a particular manner. And finally, the multidisciplinary team has resulted in specialization in child abuse matters. We're going to speak more about this later. I want to begin by talking about how do you form the MDT? How do you identify and recruit members? Who is on the team? Well, there's two types of teams. The first is what's called a basic or a skeletal team, a very small compact team. Basically, in this model, you have the police and the prosecution, and you have a social worker or perhaps even an NGO representative. Somebody who is there to represent the state and the criminal justice system, whether that be police, prosecutors, or both, and also the victim or survivor's best interests. That would be the social worker. The basic multidisciplinary team is seen most often in jurisdictions where the specialization I just spoke about may not be possible. For example, in rural jurisdictions or under-resourced jurisdictions, you will not be able to have one person, one prosecutor, for example, who prosecutes nothing but child sexual abuse. In the United States, for example, 80% of the U.S. is rural, 80 percent. So in the overwhelming majority of jurisdictions in the U.S., you will see this basic skeletal team made up of prosecution and police and social workers. Historically, there has been hostility between these two camps of the criminal justice system and the uh, social worker, the child's best interest. What we're seeing here with the multidisciplinary team is that this approach 
will help both the child and also the criminal justice system to get the conviction. So we are not only helping the child who has specifically been abused, but we are also helping the community in which the child has been abused by an increased conviction rate, which results in more confidence in the justice system and less fear for our children. That's the basic team. Who can be on a broader team? Well, the expanded team can include anybody who is on the victim's team. For example, physicians, nurses, the medical community can be included in this. Psychologists, psychiatrists, mental health professionals who are coming in to assist the child with those psychosocial needs we talked about earlier. Forensic interviewers, the individuals who are usually from either a policing or social service background who come in and take the statement from the child of what happened. Parole and probation officers can be included because in many jurisdictions these are the individuals who will be helping to draw up the sentencing um, report which sometimes gives recommendations on what should happen to the offender and it's important that they understand the dynamics of offending as well as the dynamics of victim impact. The broader team can also include NGOs or crisis centers. It can include victim advocates and victim support personnel. And jurisdictions will vary, but other jurisdictions, for example, have included the faith-based community, academics, court preparation officers, interpreters, anyone who is going to be involved with supporting the child and supporting the criminal justice process. There is a caveat with the faith-based community. If the faith-based community is involved, that's fine, so long as they understand that the goal is not only to support the child, but also to get the criminal conviction. It is necessary to vet, to do background checks on all the people who are going to be involved in the multidisciplinary team, but specifically people outside that core group of police, prosecutors, and social workers um, should be very carefully vetted. Each jurisdiction, though, is going to have its own professionals who are involved in the criminal justice system, and as such, they may also be included. For example, in South Africa, there are individuals there known as intermediaries, and in a criminal case, rather than the magistrate or the judge directly asking the child a question, rather than the prosecutor or the defense attorney directly asking the child a question. Intermediaries who tend to be either from an education background, retired teachers, or retired social workers, the question will be put to the intermediary. The intermediary will then ask the question of the child in an age-appropriate manner. So, for example, in South Africa, intermediaries would be an, a very good addition to the team. After you have identified this initial team and recruited this initial team, then you need to set up the team meeting. And at this initial meeting, you'll be going over things such as introductions, and dis introductions of each other, of all the members there, and discussions of training that they have received, specifically in child sexual abuse, but perhaps even broader topics such as sexual abuse generally or violence against women and children whether it's physical or sexual so training in terms of where they received it when they received it and on what topics they received it what sort of experience do they have again with child abuse specifically but also generally have they been involved in prosecuting adult sexual assault have they been involved in prosecuting domestic violence situations what are the reasons for joining? Why have these individuals come to this team meeting? What is it about the team that they think will be helpful? And finally, what goals does the team have? And the goals should be reflected in the mission statement. So the third part is developing a mission statement. And in the mission statement, the team purpose would be one of the highlights. So for example, are better victim services part of the team purpose? And when we talk about better victim services, do we mean the quality or do we mean the quantity, the breadth of services? 
Also, one of the team purposes is increased conviction rate. Is that one of the team purposes? Obviously, it should be in an optimal situation, all of those things. Better victim services, both in terms of quality and breadth of service, but an increased conviction rate as well. The next part would be discussing what is the scope? Who, what cases will be included in this team's agenda? For example, will it be all children, i.e. everybody under 18? Will it be children 14 and under? What exactly is the scope of these cases? Also, when we have cases of child sexual abuse, if we're setting up a multidisciplinary team to assist with that, perhaps child physical abuse may be something that this team feels should be covered, not only because the victim is the same in terms of being a child, but also because of the great overlap between sexual abuse and physical abuse. And finally, what are the guiding principles? For example, is it going to be women and children first? Is this multidisciplinary team set up specifically to look at the dynamics of crimes against women and children? Or are they going to be set up in terms of looking at all vulnerable victims and the victimology there? So for example, crimes against the elderly are often encompassed within vulnerable victim prosecutions. Then moving to writing the protocol. When you're writing the protocol, two things are crucial. First, designating duties and then establishing procedures. Within designating duties, it needs to be clearly delineated who is responsible for what and what is the chain of command? What is the flow chart? When a case is first reported, whether it's reported to the police or social services, when the first responder arrives, how does that first responder fit in? To whom do they make referrals? Exactly how is a case supposed to flow? In the US model, the prosecutor is the head of the multidisciplinary team because he or she is ultimately responsible for the case. And so in establishing this chain of command in the US system, for example, the prosecutor is the ultimate head of the multidisciplinary team simply because they are the last person in the chain. They are the person that takes the case into court. When it comes to establishing procedures, it needs again to be clearly delineated. How does the system work? Who is the single point of contact within each of the professions? Who is the single point of contact within policing, within prosecution, within social services, within the medical community? And where are they available 24-7? Finally, establishing procedures for referrals and sharing of information is key. As the team has come together and as they are working on a case, new information will be coming in after that first reporting by the child. So, for example, as medical or forensic tests come back, that information needs to be shared, not only with the forensic community to the prosecutor and the police, but also to social services and anyone else who could benefit by that knowledge but also as additional statements are taken by police or as additional evidence comes to the attention of social services. So referrals and sharing of information within the team is critical. Next, the issue of developing good working relationships. How often teams meet is up to them. Uh, they can meet on a weekly basis, they can meet twice a month, they can meet once a month. However often it makes sense for them to come together to discuss case files and upcoming issues, upcoming cases, the team must trust each other. The members must all trust each other. They must respect each other. You don't have to be best friends with everybody on the team but you must be comfortable that this person will work in a professional and ethical manner. And finally, evaluations. After a reasonable amount of time has passed, after the multidisciplinary team has been up and running for weeks or a few months, evaluating the performance of the team, looking at what works and what doesn't. Looking at issues of how to expand on successes. So for example, if you have noticed an increase in conviction rates, what specifically do you feel within the multidisciplinary approach was responsible for that success? And how can that be expanded upon? How to respond to challenges. Those can be 
big challenges like making sure that the victim is supported throughout the entire process of the criminal justice system or small challenges like making sure that the witness has a ride to the courthouse on the day of the trial. So how to respond to challenges and how to respond to setbacks. Simply because you have a multidisciplinary team in place does not mean that your conviction rate is going to suddenly become 100%. You will have setbacks and the question is how can we First of all, identify those setbacks, and second of all, how can we address them so that they are responded to and solved, hopefully. A few final issues. When putting a team together, it is critical that team members are composed of individuals who want to be there. Somebody may have 20 years of experience but not be a good fit for a team. As a former prosecutor, I can tell you I would much rather take a police officer who had minimal training but was open to learning and working within a team dynamic than somebody who had 10 or 15 years of working but didn't want to be part of a team. Team members who want to be there are first and foremost a critical component of a successful team. Second, attending trainings as a team is also very, very helpful because you share a single source of information. More importantly, you begin to better understand the team structure and how each profession can assist and support the other. So for example, you can get a better understanding of why things can and cannot be ethically or legally done. For example, why is it that you have to get perhaps a second search warrant in a case because the first search warrant was executed and suddenly new evidence or new suspicion of evidence has come to light, making sure that the police understand from a prosecutor's perspective why it is crucial to respect the rules of evidence so that anything that is retrieved by the police can be successfully entered into evidence in a court of law. Ethical considerations would be things like if a child doesn't want to give a statement on a particular day, ethics demand that you respect that child and reschedule, try to get a statement from that child or try to get a secondary statement if the child is given one statement and now you feel that you need a secondary one. But ethically, you cannot force a child to give a statement within the context of the medical community, there is much debate about whether or not ethically you can conduct a rape kit exam of a child who does not want to be examined. So understanding why some things can and can't be done, whether it's ethically or legally, and how those things impact both on the victim and on the case as a whole. Burnout or turnover, burnout by that I mean somebody just gets so tired of working these cases that they are desperate to get out. They cannot take one more day of walking into work to peruse a file that shows how a child's life was turned upside down and destroyed. There are many different ways to work on burnout and turnover. Turnover might be due not necessarily to somebody burning out but to promotion within many jurisdictions, police and prosecutors in particular have to go through different divisions and child abuse or sex crimes might be one but they may only be there for a year or so and then normally they they go on and they are reassigned to homicide. So how do you work with burnout and turnover? Well if it's burnout one of the things that we have found is that in some jurisdictions people can be reassigned for a short period of time to another division. So for example, if as a prosecutor, I am in the sex crimes unit for a short period of time, a couple months, I may be reassigned to the arson squad or to the drug squad or to the homicide division. Just something to get that person out of the child abuse area to let them gather themselves emotionally to go back in. But because this individual because the team members have received a great deal of training because they are the experts in their field. It is very critical that burnout not take a toll 
and there not be the constant turnover of people after two or three years because they just don't want to do it anymore. It's too emotionally draining. And what the multidisciplinary team has also shown is that support from within the team, support from individuals who understand exactly what you're going through can be very, very helpful in terms of addressing and remedying burnout. And finally, I want to talk about the judiciary. In the common law or adversarial system, judges or magistrates are independent, impartial triers of fact. They cannot, therefore, be part of a team. However, there are judicial training institutes, judicial colleges, judicial organizations that can provide informed training to the judiciary. And this is where the role of the academic can assist greatly. Academics can come in and provide that training showing judges what is the most recent precedent, what are the best practices. Um, for example, one thing that judges may not understand is why do children not necessarily do wonderfully well in testifying in a criminal matter? Why don't kids do well in court? And an academic can come in to a training institute and explain all of the trauma and all of the stress that the child feels, and also some of the issues with age and developmentally appropriate questions, things of that nature, so that the judges are also in an informed position. Because you can have a brilliant multidisciplinary team, but if the judge isn't informed, if the judge is ignorant of how children perform in court, um, what are the dynamics of sexual abuse? Why is it that children don't tell the first time it happens? If you don't have a judge that understands that, that multidisciplinary team is going to continue to run up against a stone wall. At this point, I'm going to conclude and just say thank you for listening to my presentation. If you have any questions or you would like to get in contact with me, the last PowerPoint slide lists my contact email. You are more than welcome to get in touch with me, and I would be more than happy to um, answer any questions that you might have. If for any reason you can't get in touch with me directly, you are also welcome to get in touch with me through Protecnon. Thank you so much, and good luck.